I can tell you, I'm happy to be up here because most of you guys know I have not preached for the last couple weeks and I've kind of been missing it a little bit. Um, I appreciate your prayers. As you know, two weeks ago, uh, I was pretty sick, so I had to call Pastor Tony on, I think, Friday morning and say, hey, would it be too much to ask you to, to just, you know, just throw together a message for, well, two days from now? And so he did that and did great. And then um, last week, I asked Pastor Mike to fill in, and he did an amazing job because uh, I just, I could not stop coughing. And so um, I still kind of am coughing a little bit, so if I go to a coughing fit today, just Ignore me, maybe, you know, play some Bejeweled while you're, you know, waiting or something, I don't know. Um, but uh, it's still happening, so, but thank you for your prayers. Um, also, thank you for all of your birthday wishes that you guys sent me and the texts and the phone calls and Facebook and the gifts and things that you gave. It was very, very sweet, very generous, so I, I appreciate that. <clears throat> My title for today is, um, admittedly, it's a little bit provocative. So if you were to just look at it standalone, you'd be like, what in the world kind of church is this? So my title for today is, How to Be More Attractive. Interesting, huh? We went to church to figure out how to be more attractive. And I promise you, that's going to make sense in a minute and it's also going to make sense in a minute why I got so dressed up. If you're, if you're visiting, you're like, oh, okay, the pastor wears a jacket here. No, he doesn't. <laughs> okay? Um, but I did. I figured I had to uh, get all dressed up. But again, that's going to make sense here in a few minutes. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 5. So for the past uh, nine weeks, at least the nine weeks that I've been preaching, um, We've been working through the fruit of the Spirit, and of course, that's found in Galatians chapter 5. These are the fruits, the, uh, the qualities that we are supposed to have as followers of Jesus. So Galatians chapter 5, and as we always do, we, we read all the way through our passage so we can get the context, and then we're going to dive right in. We've got a lot to cover today. I actually had way more notes than I have time, so I had to split this in half. Today is really more of the intro of how to be more attractive, about this one uh, topic that we're going to talk about. And you're like, wait a minute, you need two weeks to talk about one word? Yes, I can build two sermons about one word. It's a spiritual gift. I know. I get it. So here we go. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. It says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. So like I said, we've been going through these fruit of the Spirit. And we had love, joy, peace, and then what was that next one? 
forbearance. We spent a couple of weeks in forbearance, and forbearance is just a really big, fancy, much more detailed, much more intricate way to say patience. And we, we saw just in, in what we were looking at, there's many ways, but we looked at three ways that God cultivates forbearance in us. Because again, these fruit of the Spirit, we don't get to manufacture these things on our own. We can't just say, I'm going to be more patient. You ever tried that? Does that work? No. I'm going to be more kind. I'm going to be more loving. Those are things that, that God's Spirit works inside of us. So... Three ways God cultivates forbearance in us. Number one, remember God's goodness. We need to look back and see how God has been so good to us, how he has taken care of us in the past, and we can trust him that he'll take care of us in the future. Number two, we have to realize our dependency. Guess what? You can't do anything without God. It doesn't work. Believe me, I've tried it. So we need to realize, God, I am dependent on you. I, I, I am counting on you for my next breath, for everything in life. God, it all comes from you, so I'm going to be patient. I'm going to trust your time. And then the third way that God cultivates forbearance in us is to rest in confident hope. We know we have a hope. We know we have a future. We know that we've got security. And we can understand, God, you, you've got me. God, you love me more than I love me, which is a lot. But God, I, I know you're going to take care of me. I know I can be patient. I know, God, I can wait on you. So those are just three ways that we looked at that God cultivates forbearance in us. So back to verse 22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance. And the next one is? It's love, joy, peace, forbearance, and the next one is kindness. There we go. We're going to talk about kindness over these next two weeks. And you're like, okay, what in the world does kindness have to do with being attractive? Hold on, we'll get there. 1 Thessalonians 5.15. This is such a good verse. This verse is key. We all need to really, really grasp this verse. Paul is writing to this church, so he's writing to believers... He's writing to Christians in this, this church in Thessalonica. And he says, make sure, so basically this is a command. He's commanding us, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive. I love that word. It's one of my favorite words. Strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Now, what, what, is, what does that mean do what is good. What's another way to say that in context of today's message? Kindness, right? Always strive to do what is good. Always strive to do kindness. But, but look at that verse, 1 Thessalonians 5.15. What's the, what's the context of this verse? I'll read it in, in the amplified version just to show you. It says, see that none of you repays another with evil for evil but always aim to show kindness and seek to do good to one another and to everybody. So what's the context of this verse? What is Paul trying to get us to really grasp and understand and do? What do you, what do you think it is? Do you see it? I'll give you a hint. It's in the very first part of the verse. See... He's trying to get us to show kindness not to people that we like. Because that's pretty easy to do, right? What's Paul trying to get us to understand? That we need to do kindness when people are doing evil to us. When people are wronging us or harming us. That's what Paul is saying is, hey, we need to be kind. We need to strive to do what is good to those people. Now, this is weird, right? Doing good or doing kindness to people that don't deserve it is weird. It's out of the ordinary. It's, it's, it's not what we like to do. It doesn't come comfortable. It's unexpected. But that's exactly what Paul is calling us to do. So, back to the title of the message. How to be more attractive... 
And as I was thinking through this, I was like, I got to get as dressed up as I can. This is an object lesson, okay? All right? This, uh, you know, somebody actually was nice and they, they, they dusted off all of the, the lint and everything that was hanging out on it. I even broke out my nice watch. Um, it doesn't work. It's needed a battery for like two years or so. Oddly enough, I've looked at it about a dozen times today and it's still the same time. Uh, which means we have all the time in the world today. To, to, just kidding. Um, I, I wore some bling today. You see that? So, like, I really, I wanted to play this part, okay, but this is not normally me. But how to be more attractive. I, I tried to Google how long it takes the average person to get ready in the morning. Okay, the answers were all over the place. Now, now some of us guys, we don't have this problem. We, like, roll out of bed, we just throw on some clothes, and we're pretty much out the door, right? 15 minutes tops. And then there's pretty much everybody else, right? And I'm not just pointing out the ladies because, listen, I know plenty of guys that take a lot of time in the morning getting ready. So, guys, we don't, we don't uh, just, just get an out on this, right? But oftentimes it's at least an hour, isn't it? It's at least, I mean, you got to, you know, take a shower, you got to do all of that stuff, and you got to get completely ready. But here's the major problem, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but here's the major problem. Most of us spend way more time and effort trying to look nice than trying to be nice. It's true, isn't it? Now, do you see where we're going with this? We often spend more time on our appearance than our attitude. That's a problem. Because um, th there's that verse, and sometimes we talk about the pesky verses of the Bible, and I'm saying that tongue-in-cheek, but in our flesh, it's like we read some of these verses and we're like, oh, I don't really like that verse, but of course... God knew what he was doing when he threw it in there. And there's that one verse, and it says something like, man looks at the outward appearance, but what? God looks at the heart. God looks at what's inside of us. And God cares way more about our kindness and the love that we show and the peace and the patience and all those things. Now, please hear me. I'm not suggesting that anyone skips their morning routines. Like, please brush your hair, okay? Before you come here, please brush your hair. Now, extra, extra please with sugar on top, brush your teeth before you come to church or before you even leave the house, okay? Please do those things. But we have to be cautious about how much time we're spending getting ready, being more attractive than we do on what's actually inside of us. Um, there's a game that we play in my house oftentimes, and it's, it's fun. We were actually playing it um, two nights ago, and it's called Would You Rather. You guys ever heard of this game, Would You Rather? You ever play it? It's, it's great to play with your kids. It's a really good conversation starter because oftentimes you start talking about all these things. So we're going to play a few rounds of Would You Rather. Are you, you ready? Okay, here we go. Would you rather be able to talk with the animals or speak all foreign languages? Think about it. Now, the churchy answer is I would speak all foreign languages so that I can be a missionary in Africa City, Africa, and I can go spread the gospel and all. Okay, great. I would love to talk to animals. I think that would be really cool, okay? That would be cool. All right, here's another one. Would you rather win the lottery or live twice as long? Oh, that's a good one, huh? Okay, now we're in church. So don't give me your honest answer, okay? I'm just going to put it this way. Just make sure you tithe on it, okay? Here's another one. This one's kind of a not so much a would you rather, but would, what, would you feel worse? This is a good one, too. Would you feel worse if no one showed up to your wedding or to your funeral? 
Ooh, that's a good one, huh? Now, I'm just going to put this out there. The answer is wedding, and here's why. Because you're not going to know about your funeral. Just want to throw that out there, okay? All right, now, one more, and this one actually has to do with the message, okay? Now, I refrained. I've not preached in, in two weeks. I guess this is three weeks now. I refrained from stacking up three weeks' worth of jokes to tell you guys today. You're welcome. Okay, here we go. Last one. Would you rather work in an office full of very, very attractive people who were some of the biggest jerks on earth, or would you rather work in an office full of, I want to say this the right way, very average people? Okay, you see where I'm going with this? But that were the nicest, kindest people you've ever met. Option one, very, very attractive, like supermodel people, you know, all of that. But they were just absolute jerks. Would you rather work with those guys? Or would you rather work with the average looking humans that were just so and they always did kind things, and they said nice things, and they helped you in your work. Which one? Option one or option two? Everybody would say two. I'm really hoping everybody would say two. Okay? You guys know what a cheat code is? Okay, I'm not into video games. When I was a teenager, I played video games uh, a little bit. Just the average teenager, okay? Okay. Um, there's this thing called a cheat code. And in some games, when you open up the game, you can do a certain sequence of buttons, or you can type in, if it has a place, you can type in kind of the, the right code. And it's a cheat code. And it'll give you like a whole bunch of lives or you know a whole bunch of extra energy or whatever it is. So, when I was a kid, there was this game. It was a really cool game. It was called Contra. Anybody ever remember the game Contra? Please, please. Any, okay, yes, okay, we got a few. Now, to win the game of life, can any of you guys tell me what the cheat code was for the game Contra? You remember it? What is it? You're close. You're close. You're, 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 it's right there. Anybody, you got it? Anybody else? Huh? It's up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, start. And if you did that before the, 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 the like title screen came out, I mean, and you, I mean, you had to be fast, okay? If you did that, you went from three lives to 30 lives. And this game, Contra, when it came out, like you look at it now, kids will look at it and go, that is the dumbest game ever. The graphics are awful. We thought it was the coolest thing, didn't we? It was the coolest game, right? Okay, you would get 30 lives. And if you were halfway decent at the game, you could probably beat the game with those 30 lives. That was a cheat code. There was another game, Metroid. There was one, of the, uh, the cheat code was Justin Bailey, if you remember that. I know, I'm kind of showing the era that I'm from. I want to give you a cheat code to life. And this is, this is really, I mean, you, you know, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, start. You, you plug this into life, and this is, like, like, every once in a while we come across these. This is a cheat code to life. Are you ready? It's super complicated, right? Really tough to understand, really tough to follow. Here it is. If you want to look nice, be nice. That's it. Cheat code to life. If you want to look nice, and we all said we spend lots of time in the morning getting ready. We go get our hair did and our nails and all of that. We spend all that time. But how much time do we spend on this thing right here? 
So I'm just telling you, if you want to look nice, because we all said we'd rather option B to work in that office with the average looking people, but the nice ones. If that's really what we would choose, why would we not strive after that cheat code? If you want to look nice, be nice. In Colossians chapter 3, if you want to turn there, you can. It'll be up on the screen. But here's another place that Paul is writing to another church. So he's writing to believers. And, and, and he's, he's telling the church that there's something, you're, you're something new in Christ. Like, don't be the old you. Like, like, don't do what you used to do. You're something new. That's what Paul is saying to them. So he says, starting in verse 12, Colossians chapter 3, he says, therefore, so we love that word. Remember, when we see that word, it means I just told you a whole bunch of stuff, and here's why. Here's the point of it right here. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, so again, that means he's talking to Christians. He's talking to believers. If you call yourself a believer, this verse is for you. Here it is. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, that's a little bit shorter list, but doesn't that sound a lot like our Fruit of the Spirit list? Same guy, the Apostle Paul, writing this. He's basically saying, hey, if you are a follower of Jesus, you need to clothe yourself with these things, and one of them just happens to be kindness. Now, what does that mean to clothe yourself? Well, it, clothing yourselves means covering yourself. Let, let me put it this way. If I were to take a big blanket, and I were to technically clothe myself in it and wrap it all the way around me and over my head, what would you see? The blanket. Would you see me? No. You would only, now I'm in there, that's me, but I am completely covered in that blanket. And that's what Paul is saying, hey, you need to be completely covered in these things. When somebody looks at you, they don't actually see you, they see what you're clothed in, that, that compassion, that kindness, that patience, all of those things, that's what Paul is commanding us to do. Ultimately, God in his word is commanding us to do. Philippians chapter 4, verse 5, in the NAB version, it says, your kindness should be known to all. Everybody. Your kindness, it, it, it should be evident to every single person that you are just a kind person. And we're going to get to what that means here in just a second. Let me ask you this. If I went to your office or your job site or your neighborhood or your family reunion or I'm trying to basically get everybody in here, okay? Basically, if I went wherever you normally go, maybe you don't work in an office, fine. If I went where you normally go and hang out with people and I asked those people, mainly like your unchurched friends, if I said, hey, can you point to me who is the most kind person that you know? Guess what? As followers of Jesus, and according to these verses, <laughs> they should point right at us. Because that's what we're called to do. Now, I won't make you raise your hand, but how many are like, I'm not sure that they would point at me. If you ask them who's the kindest person that they know. Your kindness should be known to all. So what's the best way to describe kindness? What, what exactly, I mean, we kind of know. I mean, it's being nice to people, right? That's what we said. But I want to give you my definition of kindness. And here's basically what we're talking about. Kindness is love, or and we, and we say this all the time, that love 
is something you do, not something that you have. It's a verb, not a noun. So love is action. It's doing something, being put into practice for the benefit of someone else. That's what kindness is. It's us demonstrating love, putting it into practice so that it's benefiting other people. That's what kindness is. That's what we are called to do. Kindness isn't something that you, you hope for. Kindness isn't something that you do when you feel like it. See, because that's what we often fall into, that trap, right? I just, I, I'm just not feeling very kind today, so I don't really, you know, I just, that, today's not my day, I was kind yesterday. Kind of a dumb thing to say, right? But we live like that. That's, that's kind of how we live, isn't it? Um, I wrote this down. Kindness is an action done by choice even when you don't feel like it. It's a choice. You've got to make a choice to be kind. Now again, it's the fruit of the Spirit, so it's God's Spirit working in us because there is nothing good in you and there is nothing good in me on our own without God's Spirit working in us. But kindness is action done by choice. I heard this great example uh, several years ago, and it made me think of it um, when I was kind of studying for this throughout the last few weeks. Um, and they were actually, at the time, they were speaking about generosity. And um, he was saying some people, and I'm sure you know and I know, I know some of the most generous people on earth. Like some of my friends are very, very, very generous people. It just comes so naturally to them. The rest of us, it doesn't always come so naturally, does it? And, and I'm not just talking stuff. I'm not just talking money. I'm not just talking resources, but generous with your time, generous with your love, generous with your kindness. Just, just they have something and they want to give it to someone else. Do you, you know some of those people Maybe that's you. We have some very, very generous people in this church. But as this person was, was teaching on this, and he just was using generosity as an example, he was saying, oftentimes, we struggle with that, that, that we're not, by nature, the most generous people. He's like, so you have to fight against that. Same thing with kindness. He said, do you know how to fight against not being generous? You write a check. That's how you fight against it. You actually step out and you do that thing. You, you be generous to somebody. You, you be generous to an organization. You, you help a friend do something. You, you, that's what you do. You force yourself to do it. And you know the really weird thing that happens over time? The more and more you do that, because like, I don't want to do this, it's inconvenient, I don't really have it, uh, and the more and more you do it, guess what happens? It becomes more natural. It, it, it becomes easier. Why? Because that's how God works in us. So we have to kind of step outside of our comfort zones, and we have to make a choice to be kind, even when we don't feel like it. So... So where's the meat of this story? That was basically the introduction. Now you know why we've got to split this into two weeks, right? And we've got communion today, and I wanted to give Amanda ample time. So as I was thinking, okay, how do we split this up? What we're going to do next week, we are going to dig into uh, a story that is a great story. I guarantee every single person in this room has heard it a million times, and I want to caution you about that. Now, I've been in ministry a lot of years. I did student ministry for about 15 years, but I actually started in children's ministry, which is where most people start. And um, I still, even when we have Island KX, which is our version of Vacation Bible School, 
I'll teach a couple of the lessons during the week and whatnot. So I love teaching kids. It's so fun. I used to come in here to chapel services with Island Christian and teach chapel services. It's so fun to teach kids. But something happens oftentimes when you teach kids. Um, Because, you know, you don't go to the big theological passages and you don't, you know, break down eschatology and all this stuff with kids. What do you normally teach when you're teaching kids? Stories and, you know, parables and things. But oftentimes, these kids have heard these stories about a million times, especially if they've been in church their whole lives. And, and, and this, this thing would happen oftentimes when you would start teaching about a story. The kids would say, I already know this story. <laughs> Guaranteed there was at least one every single time. I already know this. I could say, and, and you know what I said? Well, why don't you come up and tell it? And they never took me up. Actually, they did take me up on it sometimes. Okay. Here's, here's what I want from us. Because next week we're going to dig deep into the story. And I'm going to read through the entire story here in just a minute. Just to get our wheels cranking. But even I have been kind of doing this pastor church Bible ministry thing for a while. And even I read through this story and got such a different perspective about it. And it's funny that God can actually do that. You know, he tells us that he can do that, but we, I guess, maybe sometimes forget or we get into that rut. And when we're reading, it's just, eh, you know, it's just, oh, I know this story, right? But this story spoke so much to me and I was able to just pull out so much truth in this story when it comes to kindness. So we're actually going to look at the story of the Good Samaritan, right? And it's such a well-known story. It's like, people that don't even know the Bible, there's an expression called the Good Samaritan, right? And they don't even really know the story. There's a one guy is a Samaritan. I don't even know what that is, and he helped some guy, okay? But everybody knows this story. But I want to give you a little bit of background real quick. I'll read through the story, and then we'll be done. So there was this issue between the Jews and the Samaritans at the time. And it was a really big issue. They hated each other. That's really important to understand in this story. Is that they hated each other so much, they would almost disassociate with each other. Now, at times, they had to kind of be near each other. The Samaritans would go into Jerusalem for different things and whatnot. But they, I mean, they would, like, like keep distance. The, the Jews actually thought of Samaritans like worse than animals. They weren't respected. They saw them as half-breeds. They were uh, most of them half-Jewish and half-something else. And they just, they were thought lower than humans. They were absolutely disgusting to the Jews. And by the way, the Samaritans didn't think a whole lot of the Jews. But they had a lot in common. They, for the most part, followed the same religious laws and rules of Judaism. So they somewhat coexisted, but they absolutely hated each other. And that's the setup for the story that Jesus tells. So if you've got your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 10. Such a great story. And actually, this story is more than just Good Samaritan. The story is really about this this expert in the law, a teacher of the law... ...that he's trying to trick Jesus. So he wants to go up and ask Jesus this kind of tricky question... ...to get him to stumble, to get him to mess up on something. Which they did. Oftentimes they tried to do that. By the way, if you're ever going to have a conversation with Jesus... ...don't try to trip him up. It's not going to work, okay? (laughs) Don't do that. So Luke chapter 10, we're going to start in verse 25. Like I said, I just want to read through this... Get our pump a little bit primed for next week. And I want to give you a little bit of homework. I want you to read through this story a few times this week. With the filter of kindness in mind. And and I, I want you to ask God, God, what do you want me to see in this story about kindness? Do we have a guy and he stopped and he helped a guy? Yes, that's not the answer. 
That's not the entirety of the answer, I should say. So Luke chapter 10, starting in 25. It says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to in inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? Which is very Jesus-like to be asked a question and to answer with a question, right? He's like, I know what you're doing here. I'm going to put the burden of proof back on you. He's like, you're the expert. How do you read the law? He goes on, verse 27. He answered, that's the expert in the law, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. And then there's verse 29. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Big mistake. Verse 30. In reply, I'm trying to preach my message, I gotta stop, okay? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan... And at this point in the story, everybody listening would have gone, boo, ugh, a Samaritan? Really, Jesus? You're going to put a Samaritan into your story? That's exactly what they would have thought at that moment. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. He went to him, and, and um, the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Then Jesus asked, verse 36, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. He couldn't even say the word Samaritan, but he knew the answer. The one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. So what's the point of today? What's the whole big thought of today is how to be more attractive. How to be that person in, in option two in the office scenario. How do you be that person? Very simple, we already said it. If you want to look nice, be nice. Strive to show kindness to others. Not just when people deserve it. Not just when people are kind to us. Not just when you're feeling like it. But strive to show kindness to everyone. Even, as Paul says, 1 Thessalonians 5.15, even when they are doing evil or wrong to you. That's when we are called to show kindness. Why? How can I stand up here and say that? How could I have the gall to ask you to do that? Because people wrong us, don't they? Like people do some pretty rotten things to us. And you're saying, wait a minute, Trevor. You're asking or actually really expecting me to be kind to that person? 
Yes. And you want to know how I can stand up here and say that? Because there's this verse, there's a lot of verses. And it says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ showed us the ultimate act of kindness. While we were in sin. And by the way... When you sin, it's not just doing a wrong thing. It's sinning against a holy God. And while we are in the midst of that, that verse and so many other verses says, while we were in that, he chose to die for us. We have a very, very kind God. So why would we not want to just act like him? that's what he commands us to do. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are so kind to us. God, thank you that as that verse that we just quoted says, while we were still sinners, while we were still choosing to sin against you, you died for us. Thank you, God, for that perfect sacrifice of your son, Jesus. Thank you, God, that he was obedient to take on all of our sin and to allow himself to be crucified on a cross in shame and in pain and to give up his life for us. God, I'm so, so thankful that the story didn't end there. That three days later, Jesus rose. Jesus proved that he had authority over sin, authority over death, authority over hell, and authority over the grave. Thank you, God, that you have given us a way to spend eternity with you that we can be sure of the hope that you give us. And that is through trusting in your son, Jesus. Trusting that he paid the penalty, that he is the savior, that through him and him alone, we can have eternal life with you. And God, I know that there are some here this morning who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, who do not have a relationship with you. Those here that have not put their full faith and trust in only Jesus. God, right now in this moment, would you speak to their hearts? God, let them know that they need a Savior. Why would we not want to follow such a kind God? So right now in this moment, heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus, if today is the day that you say, I want that salvation. I, today I want to start the rest of my eternity. Would you just say this? God, I trust you. I trust that your son Jesus died for me. I put my full faith and trust in Jesus. God, save me. God, change me. I give you my life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that this morning for the first time, I would love to know I'm not going to call you out or make any commotion, but I'd just love to pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up and say, today's the day that I got it right. Today's the day that I'm putting down religion and I'm starting a relationship with Jesus. Just slip your hand up and say, today's the day I got it right. Thank you. Jesus, we love you. You are so good. You are so kind. 
Thank you for the example that you have given to us. God, help us as followers of you to be kind, to love others, to be generous, to demonstrate that love that you have shown us to other people. And help us, God, to make a difference in this world that's not just going to last this lifetime, but a difference that will last for all of eternity. God, we pray for this time of offering. Thank you for the generous people we have in this church, God, that allow us to do your work, to do your ministry, to be generous in this community, and that allow us to be generous in this world. God, help us to be obedient. We pray your blessing on all things, God, that we would be wise and do things as you have called us to do. And we pray all of this in your awesome, amazing name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.